world history. Very, very close. I'm not going to set the date because I always get into trouble if I speak about something like that. And not only into trouble, but terribly misunderstood. So I thought tonight we'll just start with a little fly through, through history to see where this all comes from so that we can eventually figure out where we're going and why. And we're going to have quite a few conversations in this direction and they get a little bit more serious as we go along. So we're going to talk about finding truth tonight. And it won't work. <laughs> ah. Finding truth is not always easy. The Bible says that broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to the other place. It should be and then it says something very strange. It says, and few there are that find it. That always puzzled me because why would God make something so obscure that few there are that find it? Isn't God in the business of salvation? Why are there few that are that find it? And then I studied a little bit further and I found another verse in the Bible which says, Seek and you will find. And if you put those two together, then I must assume that few there are that find it because they refuse to seek. And God is not in the business of coercion or forcing anyone, and so he lets his spirit do the work, but if you do not seek, you will not find. And uh, one of the things that led me to find was a prayer that I once said, sitting all alone in the church, wondering about the strange doctrines that had been drilled into my mind since childhood, and having been an atheist at that stage and willing to return to atheism, I made, I don't know what that, I wouldn't call it a mistake, I would call it a blessed mistake, I got up in a little fit of anger and I said to God, if you exist, show yourself to me. Whoa. <laughs> the rest is a nightmare <laughs> and a joy, both at the same time. So challenge God. And those who've never know, heard of Adventism, challenge God and ask Him, show me why. Show me why. And the devil will show you 10,000 reasons as to why not. But remember, he's a liar. And he has more lies up his sleeve than you and I could ever possibly come up with. So every lie that the devil throws at this movement has an answer, but you have to seek for it. So let's go and find some truth. Maybe we'll need a magnifying glass on history. I've given these lectures before, I've cut them up into a short little review, so we can just see where we're going and why this is so important. Proverbs 4 verse 18 says that the path of the just is like the shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. You don't get all the truth in one big swallow, you wouldn't be able to handle it. Bite-sized pieces, that's what God gives humanity, that's what God gives us individually. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 it says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that ye have received of us how ye ought to walk, and to please God, so you would abound more and more. <clears throat> so the, the Christian growth and the growth in truth is a progressive growth. And people can reject it, and people can accept it, and people can rebel against it, or they can accept it. And God 
patiently waits and he sends his Holy Spirit and he asks people to mull it over. Doesn't he say, come, let us reason together? Yeah. God is not unreasonable. He will give you a reason for the hope within you. God is not unreasonable. And if he wants you to know the truth and you seek for the truth, there's a promise that you will find it. Because he's not in the business of hiding. Jesus said when he was confronted by his enemies, I have done how much in secret? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing in secret. And that's God's way. The world does everything in secret. Everything is secret. Or they belong to secret societies. When you hear the word secret, it's from the devil. Amen. Paul standing before Festus in Acts 24 said, Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So in Paul's day, did they call his faith system heresy? That was the established church. That was the established representative of God on earth because Jesus said salvation is from the Jews. And they called him a heretic. Even though he believed everything which is written in the law, in the Torah, in the Bible, and in the prophets. He believed every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and they called him a heretic. Do you think they could do the same to us? If they don't, I'll be very surprised. I'm pretty sure they won't. So let's go just through a sweep of history and find out how we got to the day that we are living in and why is Adventism important? Why? Why am I and why are many of you Seventh Day Adventists. Why? Surely not because of popularity. Uh, need I say more? All right. In the Middle Ages, there was one church that was ruling. I was once a member of that church. I was a Roman Catholic. I grew up with Roman Catholic doctrine, and it turned me into an atheist. A staunch God hating. Adventists. And there are many, I'm uh, not Adventists, sorry. Sorry. Repeat. Repeat. God hating atheists. And there are many living today that are exactly the same for exactly the same reason. You've ever read Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, one of our great evolutionists in the world. If you read it, you'll see that his hatred doesn't stem from God, but from a misunderstanding of God as a consequence of doctrines that have been placed in his mind that are totally unscriptural, but accepted as scriptural by large parts of the world. Now, early on, before the Reformation, more than a hundred years before the Reformation, there were voices which were saying, this cannot be right. And one of them was from the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe, and one of his followers that uh, read his works was Jan Hus from Bohemia, and they started a movement in which could not be stopped. John Wycliffe died of natural causes, but the church was so angry that a few years later they dug up his bones burned them and threw the ashes into the river Swift, hoping to get rid of his doctrines, but unfortunately the river Swift just spread them around the world. And Jan Hus, when he was burnt at the stake for his doctrines, and his doctrines were amazingly Protestant, said today, you are going to roast the goose because Hus 
in this language means goose. It says you are going to roast a goose, a goose. But in a hundred years from now, one will stand up who you will not be able to destroy. And exactly a hundred years later, Martin Luther came along and nailed 95 theses against a church door in Wittenberg. Just a little bit of history. And this is an amazing story because the 95 Theses dealt with one issue and one issue alone, and that was indulgences. He was opposed to indulgences as a means of financial gratification to a system promising salvation. And this started a ball rolling, and the Word of God was once again put into the center of the world. And of course he had to uh, hide and escape for his life. And so the elector took him to a castle, which was called Wittenberg, mm -hmm. where he went under a disguise called Junker York. And Junker means knight. So he wore a sword and he pretended to be a knight. And there in that little room there on the right hand, over there, there he translated the Word of God, the New Testament, into the native language. Not an easy task, because it took more than a hundred dialects, put them together and created a brand new language, which was called High German. So all the various sects were united under one single language in that region, namely High German. And the interesting thing is that Tyndall did exactly the same with the English dialects and put them together in a beautiful document when he translated the Bible. And you can finish before he too was executed and burnt at the stake. And another man by the name of John Rogers came along and finished the work so that you and I can have a Bible. And the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ was again put into the center of the human soul. So moving away from a works-based religion, moving away from a salvation which did not require Christ, to one that put Christ back into the center, the world was split by the Reformation. And it didn't stop there because truth, truth is progressive. So what did Martin Luther actually do? Well, he translated the Bible and he discovered many beautiful things in the Bible. And he believed many things that his followers no longer believe today. But the central truth that he discovered was righteousness by faith. Salvation through Christ and Christ alone the Word and the Word alone is the standard of all teaching and righteousness. And that we are saved by the imputed and imparted righteousness of Jesus Christ. And no works whatsoever could do that which was accomplished at the cross. Amen. That was a great truth. But unfortunately, many of these Protestants stuck to the knowledge and understanding that they had reached at that particular time. So the followers of Luther became Lutherans. The followers of Calvin became Calvinists, etc., etc. And any new truth was not easily accepted. There's one thing that's very interesting. In the Middle Ages, the church ruled absolutely with the help of the state. They were a union that was inseparable. That was burnt into the psyche of humanity. So when Protestantism split, they split into Protestant cantons and Roman Catholic cantons, but the model of governance that the Catholic used was taken over as is by the Protestants. 
So the Protestants also use church and state to enforce their doctrines, just like Catholicism has done. And if you happen to be a Catholic living in the Protestant area, you better get out of there and go to a Catholic canton where you have to be come a Lutheran or be wiped out. And vice versa, if you were a Lutheran or you wanted to be a Lutheran and you were in a Catholic canton, then you had to get out or you would be executed and you would not survive. And a very important thing was baptism. Infant baptism was incredibly important. Couldn't do without it because it was like a birth certificate. When you were born, you were registered with the state and with the church. So you were automatically, when you were born a Catholic, or you were automatically, when you were born a Lutheran or a Calvinist or any one of those, depending on where you were. So it was a very important registry, and it was important to have the numbers. The state needed it, and the church needed it. So infant baptism was very important. Now, in the time of Luther, one of his associates was called Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt. <laughs> Don't like that name? <laughs> well, that was his name, Andreas Bodenstein, and he came from a town which was called Karlstadt. So later on, they just called him Karlstadt. That's like calling someone Boston. <laughs> Now, he was no ordinary man, he was the dean of the Wittenberg University. So he was higher in position than Luther, who was a professor, as was the dean. In fact, Andreas Bernstein was the one who kept him and gave him his doctorate. So he's a very important individual, and he adopted the Reformation just like Luther did. He was a little bit progressive. We don't have to read all that stuff, I'll tell you the story. And he discovered some other things while Luther was away and hidden away in the castle writing the New Testament. He discovered some things in the Word of God and he wanted to implement. For example, he said, we don't need any of these statues and idols in the churches. Let's get rid of them. So they threw them out of the churches. And then he discovered something else. He discovered that the Sabbath was the seventh day of the week and not the first day of the week. Now that put the cat amongst the pigeons. <laughs> and when Martin Luther came out from his exile at the Wittenberg, and there was much turmoil, Martin Luther felt that this progress was too rapid. So in the end, poor old Andreas Bodenstein was exiled. And uh, they went back, put the statues back, the people couldn't move that fast, and they didn't accept the Sabbath. Now this is a verse in the book of Revelation where it talks about the church of the Protestant Reformation, and they call it Sabbaths. Remember that? And it says there in that book that I have not found your work complete. So there were things that were undone. And so truth is progressive, but it is always persecuted. Always. So poor old Andreas was exiled. Later on, much later, Luther and he somehow reconciled. And now there was another man who became very important because he discovered something else. Now, I love these names. His name was Balthasar Hutmeyer von Waldhut. <laughs> now again, Waldhut is the place that he came from. Balthasar Hutmeyer was his name. He was a German and a Baptist. So what did they discover in the Word of God? They discovered adult baptism. And when they showed it to the Protestants and said, you know what? The Bible speaks about adult baptism. At first, the Calvinists were quite excited and said, yes, this is biblical. But then they realized that if they implemented 
then their subjects won't be inaugurated into their churches at birth or registered with the state at birth, so it became a problem for the separation of church and state. You have adult baptism. And so he was seriously in trouble. The other thing that they absolutely stood for is that a free church of believers could not be subject to the state. In other words, in the sense that the state had no right to dictate religion to them. And for that, the Anabaptists were slaughtered by the thousands. And they killed them by immersion. They drowned them. They said, do you want to be baptized again? We'll baptize you again. And they held them under the water until they were sure they were baptized. And that was the preferred method of death for the Anabaptists. But they didn't die out. Why not? Because truth is contagious. But there's another problem, and that is another enemy that always seems to get into the fray. When there is truth, you can be sure the microphones won't work. <laughs> <laughs> they won't. <laughs> and so they had other problems. They started to become well, let's just say excitable in their meetings. And so they had manifestations like rolling around in the Holy Spirit, etc. And people were disgusted with them and they received some pretty bad press. But not all of them were like that. Some of them just had straight, beautiful truths mingled with some errors, just as the others had. <laughs> Martin Luther actually said, don't force religion. I like this quote. Christians fight only with the word against the devil's teaching and work. I will preach, speak, write, but I will force and drive no one. <coughs> For faith must be willing and unconstrained. Heresy can never be resisted with fire. And he said, Keep the fists down, but let the minds clash. That's why our ministry is called Clash of Minds. And it comes from that quote. So let the minds clash. But unfortunately, he followed, didn't, didn't follow suit. And they slaughtered these poor Anabaptists, whether they were in, in Lutheran cantons, or whether they were in Catholic cantons, or whether they were Calvinist cantons, they were mm -hmm. slaughtered by the thousands. Some of them escaped and went to countries where they received some form of refuge, but uh, not all of them. There was another Anabaptist that is very, very interesting. His name is Hans Hut. Now, Hut in German is a hat. So his name was Hans Hat. Now, Hans Hat was an Anabaptist that discovered something else in the Bible that really, really impressed him. And you know what it was? It was premillennialism. Does that ring a bell? So Hans Hut believed that you should have adult baptism. Because he was an Anabaptist. He was not one of those excitable people, but he believed in adult baptism. And he believed that the world was wrong with regard to the millennium. Now, the Catholics and the Lutherans, they believe in a millennialism. There's no millennium. The church is going to rule, and that's the way it's going to be. And then there were, of course, those that believed that the church would rule for a thousand years here on earth. But Hans Hut said, no, that's not biblical. Biblical is that Christ returns before the millennium and that the children of God are taken to heaven for during the millennium. And after that, Christ sets up his kingdom. Wow, well, you don't teach things like that when the rest of the world teaches something else. 
And so they tortured him horribly while he was in Lutheran area bringing this message and wanting to speak to them and show this to them from the Bible. They tortured him, they put him into a dungeon and he was so weak, a camel fell over and he burned to death. So truth is not very welcome. There was another man in Germany, these, these Anabaptists were, were a problem. And this man's name was Oswald Klett. Oswald Klett. He was also a German Anabaptist, and he penned a book which he called Von Sabbat, about the Sabbath. And he wrote that the Sabbath should be held again, that it was part of the law of God. He was arrested and imprisoned in Vienna in 1545, taken out at night and drowned in the autumn of 1546, just like any Anabaptist that was caught suffered the same fate. So, there were many truths that were discovered post-Reformation, but they weren't allowed to flourish. But the thoughts were placed in the minds of men, and as they studied, they found the baptism, adult baptism was biblical, they found the Sabbath, and they asked questions about the Sabbath, and they found all of these interesting doctrines, Martin Luther believed in the state of the dead, and Tyndall believed in the state of the dead, and Fritsch believed in the state of the dead, and John Bunyan believed in the state of the dead, that it is asleep. But the rest of them wouldn't follow suit. Glad argued either the Sabbath must be kept or all the other nine commandments must also be rejected. Sunday said was the Pope's invention and its abrogation is the devil's work. Christ is stated has never broken or abolished the Sabbath but instead he established it. His purpose was not to break or abolish the Sabbath, but to confirm and adorn it. His teachings on the Sabbath spread to Moravia and even to Scandinavia. And today there are about, what, four million Anabaptists scattered all over the world. Many come from the German Baptists, some come from the Mennonites, some come from the Amish, and they're spread all over, particularly, North America. So Menno Simon is the one that uh, sort of planned the doctrines of the Mennonites, believed in adult baptism, not all of them believed in the Sabbath like Glad did, not all of them believed in premillennialism, but the ideas were there. You know what they did to the poor Mennonites? They found refuge in the Dutch regions because uh, the Prince of Orange was for religious freedom. And these guys were such good farmers, they gave them the worst farmland that they could possibly find and said, there, farm there, and you'll have religious freedom. And these guys would turn that farmland over and in soon it would blossom like a, like a desert turned into a garden of Eden. And when they saw that the farms had been improved and were so beautiful and well taken care of, they confiscated them all and gave them the worst land in the area for them to start all over again. These guys had a tough life, you know that? And they had a tough life because they had discovered a few kernels of truth that were not allowed to live as a consequence. And then there were the evangelical battles in England. Like Luther who believed in the soul sleep and John Frith who believed in the soul sleep. And uh, John Frith was burnt for his beliefs and I understand the Church of God in a wide sense. It contains all those whom we regard as members of Christ. It is a net thrown into the sea. The opinions for which men go to war is said on what the terrible tragedies they make. Let there be no longer any question amongst us, Twinglians or Lutherans, for neither Twingly nor Luther died for us. 
and we must be one in Christ Jesus. You don't say things like that, you get killed for that. So the man was burnt at the stake. John Norton, who wrote Paradise Lost, left leave his soul sleep. And then they were the founders of the Congregationalists. Now, in England, to become a Congregationalist means that you believe that the congregation decides what is true, and not the state. So what do you do with founders of this organization? You can name with Barrow and Greenwood, and you say it's the state doesn't have the right to dictate doctrine and kill them. So there was no idea. Truth always comes at a price. And then the first Baptists came to England. They say they have no roots for the Anabaptists. They discovered Adolf Baptism all by themselves, and the movement grew, but it was terribly suppressed. The first one was John Smith. He believed in Adolf Baptism, and he started this faith in Amsterdam. And they separated from the Church of England, and that's why they were called separatists. And they were terribly persecuted. There was John Bunyan. Pilgrim's Progress. These people sat in jails and sweltered there for years and years and years because of what they believed. Truth is expensive. It's very expensive. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he was a Baptist, a very famous one. His mother had 17 children. Nine died when they were still in their infancies. And he was only 10 years old when he became interested in preaching. He was a marvelous preacher. There are thousands of sermons by Spurgeon. But his views were Calvinistic. So he believed in baptism by adults, baptism by immersion. But his views were Calvinistic. And the Baptist Church developed two views on salvation. And one of them is this Calvinistic view, and the other one is the non-Calvinistic view of salvation. So there was a lot of argument. Now eventually, when this good land over here, the United States, opened up, all of the people that could made their escape from the terrible persecutions and the murder that took place in the old world. And they came in their droves and they settled here in the United States of America. I want you to understand this because the way in which God works is just amazing. Here they came and originally they just wanted to start their settlements and originally they also tried to get the state to support them, but eventually things worked out different here in the United States. And the Baptists also discovered the Seventh-day Sabbath, but not all of them. And so some of them split off and they became Seventh-day Baptists. And one of them was Rachel Oaks. Now we're getting closer to what is important in this world. There was another movement that started in England, and that was John Wesley's movement. And this is a very important movement, <laughs> the Methodists. Now originally they were part of the Church of England. They were Church of England preachers, but they were called Methodists in a mocking fashion, because they said you really have to implement what you believe. You can't just believe, you have to do. That's a terrible thing to say to someone. <laughs> you can't just believe, you have to do. You have to do what is right. And by the way, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't pollute it with all kinds of toxins, drinking away, eating whatever you want to eat. That's not right. We need a temperance movement. That was very popular. <laughs> yeah. 
Some of you are getting around sarcastic, right? <laughs> and the Methodists, they came into conflict with the Church of England, because here were people that were saying, you don't need to change your lifestyles. You need to take salvation in Christ serious. And John Wesley wrote over a thousand hymns, some of the most beautiful hymns that we could ever imagine. Either the first one or the second one that he wrote was, And Can It Be? One of my favorite hymns. I love that hymn. And can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Beautiful hymn, beautiful hymn. I always say that's one hymn that the Roman Catholic Church cannot sing. Only a Protestant can sing that hymn. Luther, and Luther said, The God that didn't die for me, I will not accept. And we had another beautiful hymn played with a trumpet here earlier. Do you remember that? How great thou art. And the Jesuits say they hate verse 3 because they don't believe in that doctrine. So they hate verse 3. Where God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. Such a beautiful doctrine by the blood of the Lamb you are saved. And they don't believe it. They don't believe they're saved by the blood of the Lamb, they're saved by your works. And therefore, those people were persecuted. Wesley was dragged through the streets by his hair. They used to then have outdoor meetings because they weren't welcome to preach in the churches anymore. And the townsfolk would take their cattle and run them through the crowd. That's like someone bringing a herd and chasing it through the stead. They were terribly persecuted for what they believed. And they brought the battle of the minds, the clash of minds as to the way in which you were saved to a head. And the Methodists played such an important role. They brought it to a head that you are saved by faith in, the, in Jesus Christ. You are saved by faith and it's called prevenient or enabling grace and uh, they rejected Calvinism and this man was very adamant about his thoughts on Calvinism. You see, Besides Christful preachings, Methodists also preach sanctified living. They regard the body as the temple of God and advocated health practices such as abstaining from harmful habits such as smoking and drinking. They castigated the Calvinistic view of predestination and leaned towards Arminianism. Now, this was a very important debate. I remember the Baptists. Spurgeon was still a Calvinist. The Methodists swung over to Armenians. And this was a very interesting debate. And here's a little <laughs> cartoon of those days where you had scales and uh, two sets of scales. The general public or the general church had the Bible on its scale and the sword of the state. Can you see it there? There's the sword of the state. And the Armenians had the Bible, the same Bible, but they had the doctrine of Armenius that uh, there's no predestination in the sense that you are predestined to go to hell or predestined to go to heaven. Today, the Calvinists in my country have just recently re-signed the document where they say that they stand by every Calvinist precept. And uh, they believe that man is so fallen that he cannot make a choice, therefore God makes a choice for you. 
And if you are chosen to go to hell, then you must still praise God because by the suffering that you undergo in hell, by the contrast, you glorify those that are not in hell. And if you are predestined to be saved, you stand under irresistible grace. You will be saved whether you like it or not. So then you ask yourself the question, well, what is the criterion whereby God decides whether you are saved or whether you are lost? Well, you can choose anything you want to. Unfortunately, much of humanity decided that the good criterion to use for such a, a decision could be race. How about race? So some believe that if you are white, you are predestined for heaven, and if you are black, you are predestined to hell. And there are many on the other side of the fence that believe that if you are black, you are predestined for heaven, and if you are white, you are predestined to hell, and never the twain shall meet. But the Bible says, by one blood, he created all of humanity. So how do you get past all of that? Can you see the confusion in the world with terrible doctrines? I'll tell you a story. I was just in Germany. And I still can't get it out of my mind. It was just two weeks ago. Maybe three. I think it was two and a half. Well, maybe. And I was lecturing in Germany. And it was a big hall, were more than a thousand people in the hall, and there was this one girl, and she sat in the chair in a fetal position. Brilliant in mind, but cannot speak. Cannot at all speak, but she can write on a computer. And uh, she listened to many of my lectures. And we were asked to go and pray for her. And I went to her, my wife and I, we went to her, and there she was, just all curled up in the chair. Sitting amongst all those thousands of people, I don't know why, why she even came, but there she was. And I felt so sorry for her. And I just reached out and I touched her shoulder. She instantly fell out of that chair onto the floor, unconscious. She couldn't even take the touch of a human being. Totally devastated. And then she wrote to us and told us what the story was. She grew up in a home where her parents had strong Calvinistic views. And she was told from the beginning that she was a child destined for damnation. And therefore she was terribly abused because it didn't matter what you did to her. So she'd been abused all of her life and couldn't believe that God could even love her. That's what these doctrines do. They were so horrendous. And it should even be a debate. It's rather sad. And so my wife has been writing to her and we've been trying to make her understand that the predestination that God speaks about in the Bible is for those who answer the call. Then you are predestined to go to heaven, but the choice is yours. Choose thee this day whom you will serve. If the wicked man turns from his wickedness and does what is right in the eyes of the Lord, none of his former wickedness will be remembered. If the righteous man turns from his righteousness and does what is evil in the sight of the Lord, none of his former righteousness will be remembered. He will certainly die. Why would you die, O house of Israel? Turn, turn from your evil ways and live. Does that sound like predestination? No. But these doctrines are all over, and the state won the battle <laughs> and this battle rages freedom of conscience jo joshua 24 verse 15 and it seems evil unto you to serve the lord 
Choose ye this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is your choice. And God honors your choice. But he gives it to you. That's why James Madsen, when he became president, says, said the purpose of the separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. That's why this nation was different. And you know what's interesting? Whereas in Europe, the Lutherans and the Calvinists and uh, the Church of England and all of these state churches, they were still funded by the state, by the way, became a minority in the United States of America. They became a minority. The largest churches in the United States were the Baptists and the Methodists. So what happened? And then some of these other thoughts that had come through with the, the Mennonites and the Amish and all of these other little congregations, some believing this, some believing that, but allowed to remain believing what they believe they all came into this melting pot, which is the United States of America. And those that were left behind, that refused to go along with light that God had graciously given them, but had slaughtered them and drowned them, they were left behind. And so truth could only be gathered in a land where truth was allowed to live. Mm -hmm. And that was the United States of America. Well, a revival was to come even to the United States of America. And there was a man by the man by the name of Charles Grandison Fenny. He was from 1792 to 1875. So let's look back in the 1844 years. And he started a great revival here in the United States. He's credited with the great revival. But revivals always have two sides. And he was a millennialist. That means he believed that the church would rule for a thousand years here on earth. And in the midst of this, there was another movement that happened at roughly the same time. So the second awakening moved the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians, who are Calvinists, in an Armenian direction. So the debate was on about the character of God. Is God so mean as to condemn you to death from the moment that you are born and put you under <coughs> damnation to roast forever and ever and ever without you having a choice in the matter? Also, under John Randall and Durham, New Hampshire, the Free Will Baptists separated from the Calvinistic Baptists. Here was a clash of minds. And the character of God was at stake. What is God like? Why was I an atheist? Why was I an atheist from the age of 10? Because the Catholic nun told me in religious instruction that my mother was going to roast forever and ever and ever because she was a Lutheran. <laughs> so at the age of 10, I told her what she could do with her God. And I was thrown out of the religious instruction class and thrashed every single religious instruction class by the Lutheran headmaster for my indiscretion in the Catholic catechism class. And then the German teacher, who was also a Lutheran, decided it was a good target and thrashed me every single time I came into his class because he didn't want such an irreligious boy in his class. Then the headmaster would come along and seal my fate with another six of the best. You all know my story. I hated schools. I tried to blow them up. <laughs> yeah. 
So it was very interesting. Eventually they merged into what is called the Christian Connection, whose desire to base their faith on the Bible alone led them to embrace the biblical doctrine of the sleep of the dead. So here was a movement in North America where the character of God being on trial was put back into the center and some of these doctrines started coming through and what Jan Hus died for was unearthed by the Millerite movement when they rediscovered premillennialism. I imagine that. Here were doctrines for which you were murdered in the old world, growing in the new world. And the time had come to gather God's people from every tribe and nation and confession that existed in the time immemorial. God wants a people that stands for all the truth, Amen. not part of the truth. Yes. And no state is going to dictate to God's people what they may and may not believe. Amen. Uh, do you think it's going to stay that way? No. I have news for you. This is such a fascinating history, isn't it? Amen. It's just look how it unfolds. It's so beautiful. And here were such famous Millerite preachers like Josiah Mitch. He was a Methodist. And then there was Charles Fitch, a former pastor of the Congregational Church. Church and state don't belong together. And then there was Hines, pastor of the Second Christian Church of Boston. And all of these people, all of these confessions came together and they accepted the Millerite movement. There was no such thing as a millennium of peace and safety where the church rules. Christ will return before that time. And from all these congregations, they came together. And Lynch belonged to the Methodist Episcopal Church. Hines, Charles Fitch, pastor of the Congregational Church. These people wrote pamphlets. They worked their fingers to the bone to tell the world that Jesus was coming soon. And then a man by the name of Joseph Bates. Have you ever read Joseph Bates' autobiography? It's a blessing when you read it, isn't it? Marvelous book. I just read it again the other day. And I'm so thrilled by these people. Man, this man could spit. He could spit further than anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I <he> did. <laughs> I think he had a vocabulary as big as the modern English, just in cuss words by himself. And he had a very believing wife. And she always snuck a Bible into his penny horrible books that he read. And eventually, He's the one that discovered, rediscovered, what the Methodists have been preaching a long time, and that is the temperance movement. And he discovered the Sabbath again. And all of these truths were gathered, and all of these people started coming together. And then the sanctuary message after the, the great disappointment of 1844. I remember the day when I discovered the sanctuary message. I was so blown away. Here I was, an atheist, reading the sanctuary message. How much of the Old Testament consists of the sanctuary message? Oh, no. Just about all of it, right? And then you take this beautiful message and you throw it away and you say it is of no relevance whatsoever. Why did God not bother to put it in the Bible? And then when you look at it and you find out the path of salvation, you come through that door. I am the door. And you come to that altar, the cross. And you come to that labor, the washing of rebirth. And you come into the holy. I'm the light of the world. I'm your mediator. And I'm the bread of life. 
And then the law with the mercy seat, Bena staring. And the cherubs looking down on it with awe. And you realize the plan of salvation written in the sanctuary. And I was sitting with a minister from another church that had visited us. And he was appalled that I'd become an Adventist. And he and his wife were there. And I talked to him about the sanctuary. And I was so excited to tell him about the sanctuary. And after a little while, he got up and he cursed at me. And he said, you're just trying to make me look stupid in front of my wife. <laughs> I said, why? What, what did I do now? He knew nothing about the sanctuary. He was a minister in the church, and he knew nothing about the sanctuary. Nothing. I remember when I became an Adventist, I thought, but that's not fair. You can't tell these people, you know, that they're all wrong. How can you call the Pope the Antichrist? So I went and fetched the Catholic priest. Took him to my home. My wife and I sat him down, we talked to him, and we asked him why, why the Catholic Church had changed the law of God. He said to me, I'm not into scripture. <laughs> That's what he said. I nearly fell off my chair. I said, You're a priest and you're not into scripture? He says, No, we have specialists in that. I guess they're the Jesuits. They have, they have specialized, specialized in calling it the poisonous ass and destroying it. And leave that as it may. These beautiful truths are there in the Bible for anyone to study if they should wish. But God is not going to force you, and Iron Edson is the one who discovered it. Yeah, he's a couple of miles away. And then this little couple, James and Ellen Gould White. In this neck of the woods, do you realize how important that is? In this neck of the woods where I am standing now, where you are seated, seated, God moved upon the hearts of all of those people I just mentioned to bring about a gathering of the truths that the people had shed their blood for, but they were allowed to survive on this soil. And he put them into one congregation. And according to his promise for the last days, when he said, I will pour out my spirit in those last days, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, he called this young lady at the age of 17 to receive visions that would direct the people to the scriptures and one by one unearth all of these truths that had been rejected by the old world and by the other systems. And because there were ministers from every single walk of life and all of these congregations in the movement, every single one of those denominations had another opportunity to accept or reject truth. Did that happen, yes or no? Yes. And they sat in their churches because Miller never said leave your churches, stay in your churches. And they stayed in the Methodist church. Ellen White was a Methodist. James White came from that funny movement that didn't believe in the immortality of the soul and he put them together and then they sat in those churches and when they believed in premillennialism and they believed the doctrine of the second coming when Jesus promised that he would come and that beautiful verse in John I go to prepare a place for you and when I go I will come again 
so that you can be where I am also. That gospel in one little verse and the churches couldn't handle them. Unfortunately, the laws were such they couldn't drown them, they couldn't slaughter them, they couldn't burn them at the stake, so they drove them out of the churches. With all those doctrines. And they sat down with their Bibles and the Holy Spirit worked upon them and they discovered all of these beautiful truths. Amen. And they put them together. And Rachel Oaks, a Seventh-day Baptist, went to them and said, excuse me, you say you want to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? What about the Fourth Commandment? And so when evangelism opened up for the Adventists, they said, well, we leave the Seventh-day Baptists. They're pretty close. Let's work on the others. These are beautiful truths. And they came at such a heavy price. And this church has them. This church has them. If you want to follow the Bible and the Bible alone, if you want to believe the doctrine of salvation, if you want to believe the character of God is beautiful, you better become a Seventh-day Adventist. So what were the testimonies for? I recommend to you, dear reader, the Word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that Word we are to be judged. God has in that Word promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of His people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. Thus God dealt with Peter when he was about to send him to preach to the Gentiles. No new Bible truth was added because of the testimonies. Just the beautiful gems were set in right settings of gold. Pride, self-love, selfishness, hatred, envy, jealousy have beclouded the perceptive powers and the truth which would man make you wise unto salvation has lost its power to charm and control the mind. The very essential principles of godliness are not understood because there's not a hungering and thirsting for Bible knowledge, purity of heart and holiness of life. The testimonies are not to belittle the word of God, but to exalt it and attract minds to it that the beautiful simplicity of the truth may impress. If you accept biblical truths that the other denominations have refused, you think you will be popular? No, you won't be popular. You can't be popular. You can't. And if they cling to error and refuse to go along with truth, are they then not confused? What do you call that confusion? Battle. 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 That sounds pretty mean to call someone battle. But if you insist on being confused and refuse the plainest, thus says the Lord. So people ask me, what are you? I said, I'm an excellent Lutheran. <laughs> I believe in salvation by faith, and faith alone. I believe that the word is the standard whereby my life must be ruled. And I believe, like Luther, in soul sleep. I'm a little one. Yes, I'm a little one. I'm a Methodist. I believe the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I believe, like Luther, dead in salvation by faith. I believe that God's character is not one that condemns you without giving you an opportunity. I believe all of those beautiful things, but I also believe in premillennialism, and I believe that Jesus is coming soon, and I believe that you must keep all the commandments of God, because if you fail in one, you break them all. Isn't that biblical? Amen. What's wrong with these people? So the doctrines that were discovered were the sanctuary doctrine. Is it biblical? Yes. 
Yes. You sure? Yes. The doctrine of the second advent, I will come again. Does it stand in the Bible? Yes. The Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to establish that not one chapter or one total will, total will by any means disappear from the law. And the Old Testament says, Verily, verily, my Sabbath you shall keep. Is there anything wrong with that? No. No. State of the dead. The dead know nothing. Is that biblical? Amen. Amen. And the spirit of prophecy. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. If the prophetic gift doesn't exist in your church, find one where it does exist. Because it's biblical. And if you don't like those, you remain a Lutheran or a Methodist. They are beautiful people in the Lutheran church. Probably some of them nicer than in the Adventist church. <laughs> and then they've got to proclaim the three angels' messages. Hmm. That's a problem. And I saw this angel saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Judgment? Pre-advent judgment? When, I, when he comes, he'll have his reward with him, won't he? Yes, and worship him who may. That message went out in 1844 and in the exact same year, Darwin put together his little notes and sent them to his colleagues on oh, God never made it. It came about naturalistically. But at the same time, he was part of the ghostly guild. In other words, he spoke to spirits and experienced spiritual activities and belong to secret society. Fascinating people. So the hour of his judgment, Isaiah 56, thus says the Lord, give you judgment, do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that loath hold on it and keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keeping his hand from doing any evil. Is there anything wrong with that verse? No. So why should you be persecuted if you want to keep it? It's a good question. And another angel said, Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. They received the truth. They had the people in their midst. They couldn't deny the doctrines because they were in the scriptures. But they kicked them out of the church. And they didn't want to form a new church, but eventually they did. And they called it, by the inspiration of God, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. We keep the Seventh Day and we believe in the coming of Christ. So these days, let's leave that up and just say Advent movement. No, the Seventh Day Adventist. Amen. Because that rubs it into people's faces. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not a shame to be a Seventh Day Adventist. Amen. But to be one, you can't be an evolutionist. <laughs> so God in His grace showed me that evolution was not biblical, number one, and number two, it wasn't even scientific. <laughs> So what happens to the churches when they throw out those? Because they want to, don't want to be confronted with truth. They become confused. That's why you have 42,000 denominations, each one not knowing what they're preaching. And then the third angel. Oh, this third angel. Don't worship the beast. Don't worship his image. And that image is being set up before our eyes. And we're going to talk about it this weekend. And we're going to see that time is up. And I believe that revival will come from the east. Amen. 
I believe revival is coming from the East. Brothers and sisters in Christ, look at the sweep of this history. Just look at it. Look how much it costs to predicate together the truths that we stand for today. Test the truth to see if they are of God. And if they are from God, cling to them. Will you be popular? No, you will not be popular. There are people within our own ranks that believe that we should become ecumenical, that we should not be so intolerant. I'm not intolerant of anyone out there. I'm intolerant against false doctrine. But I would love for everyone to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Amen. Not because I worship the congregation or worship this final movement, but because they have the truth. Amen. Does that mean they all have to, does that mean they all live up to the truth? No. Doesn't the Bible say the wheat and the tares grow together? Are you in a church that has no tears? No. If you are, find one that has tears. <laughs> because there are many that believe that you should untear yourself at this stage. But as far as I understand, the shaking has not completed its work yet. And what will bring the shaking to its head will be persecution. I haven't seen full-blown persecution. I've seen a little persecution here and there, even on my own body. But that's okay. That's okay. Jesus stuck it up. The disciples stuck it up. They always tell you, Jesus and his disciples started a new church, the Christian church. Excuse me, how can the Messiah start a new church? He is the church. <laughs> he is the church. Those that didn't accept the Messiah were shaken out. Jesus didn't shake himself out and become a new church. Go ye first to the lost children of Israel. Give them another three and a half years even though they murdered me. And the same with me, and the same with you I hope. Wait, wait, wait patiently for the Lord. The shaking will come. The truths we stand for will stand unadulterated. This is a movement of separation from sin and from the world. Amen. This is not a movement of compromise. Amen. And this movement will go through to the kingdom. Amen. And don't be afraid of the time of trouble. Don't work yourself up into a frenzy about the time of trouble. Because Jesus said, your bread and your water will be sure. Who will have a time of trouble? The church or the world? The world gets blessed. The world gets hunger. The world gets earthquake. The world gets pestilence. God says, a thousand will fall by your side, ten thousand by your right hand. It shall not come near you. Don't think for one moment that because you are without a mediator at that stage, that you are without Jesus at that stage, because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. He will give his angels charge over you. We are heading for that time, brothers and sisters. And I'm hoping that the revival can start in the East. May God bless you. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, these beautiful truths that cost so many lives, that were taken to this continent, the only continent in the entire world where these truths could flourish and grow unmolested for 
a season. Only to be gathered into a final movement embracing them all. Vindicating the character of God. May all of those seated here today, may they be part of that great movement with that loud cry vindicating your character, vindicating your law, vindicating your truth. And may the world soon see that you love those that love the truth. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.